So my name is Adrian and this is Daniel Hom. Uh, we're both from the company Six to Start and we, uh, we make alternate reality games. So these are, it's kind of a loose definition, but basically these are games that take place online and often use multiple media or um, take place in the real world. Now this project we're talking about here, um, We Tell Stories, is not really a classical uh, alternate reality game. It's basically an experiment in digital fiction. Um, so, so this project was obviously for Penguin Books in the UK. And Penguin have always been very interested in digital fiction, in experimenting with telling stories online. And last year in 2007, they did a project called the Wiki Novel, where um, they opened up a wiki, standard wiki, to the public, and they had thousands of people write a book together. And, um, you know, it's very popular. I, uh, the quality of the story, I think, even the people at Penguin would agree <coughs> that it wasn't, you know, bestseller material. Um, and and uh, I believe I've heard someone comment, you know, it might not have been the most read book, but it was certainly the most written. Um, so, but, you know, th that was an interesting experiment. And this year they wanted to try something using more traditionally authored fiction. So, you know, they got... They wanted to see if they could get their, you know, their top authors to uh, create stories online in a way that could only be done on the web and not in any other medium. So traditionally, um, stories that are online, uh, particularly those from publishers, traditional publishers like Penguin and Scholastic and HarperCollins, what they normally do is they take a text that already exists, um, you know, a story or a, a novel, and they go and put it online. And they might add some pictures and add some animations, but really it's just the same book transplanted onto the web. And because you know, current displays aren't very comfortable to read on, um, arguably the experience of reading long form fiction on the web is worse, you know, a lot worse than reading it on normal paper. So what we wanted to do with this project was to explore uh, very new ways of doing things. Um, so we had six authors, six of Penguin's authors, um, write six different stories uh, specifically for the web. So these are all six new stories. Um, and right from the very beginning, when they, when they wrote them, we, we worked with them to sort of sculpt the stories so they would fit the designs that we're creating for the web. And these six stories were told over six weeks in six different ways. So. As far as our design process goes, uh, we started out by coming out of six story designs. Um, you know, you, you don't think of having to design a story normally because the design is always the same. It's, it's a book. It's about you know, 60 to 100,000 words long. It's linear. That's it. Well, we want to do something different. Um, so our six designs were stories told in Google Maps um, over blogs and Twitter. Um, we had a fairy tale, make your own fairy tale story. Uh, we had a story told live in real time over five days, a story told using infographics, and finally a sort of next generation choose your own adventure. And um, like any good album, we wanted to start strong and end strong. So the first story we did was the one on Google Maps. I mean, we knew that this would get a lot of attention because it involved maps and it looked nice. Um, and this story was called the... 21 steps. Um, each of the stories, each of the six stories was based off a Penguin classic, and this was based off uh, the thriller The 39 Steps. So this tells a story of a man who, in a case of mistaken identity, uh, or so it seems, is chased across the United Kingdom, across, you know, across the continent, um, and you follow what he does over, well, f from above. And um, we didn't know that from the start. I mean, we knew that we wanted to tell something using Google Maps. We knew that this would be an interesting way of doing it because you're really giving a story a sense of place. Um, and we thought, okay, there are a few different ways we could tell a story. We could do it as, a, as an adventure, as a travelogue, you know, around the world in 80 days. But it seemed to us like a thriller, something that would involve the character constantly moving all the time would be the way to go. Because if you have the character sitting still in a building, you know, having a meeting or whatever, for a few chapters, um, it gets pretty boring and it's not a lot of point uh, just looking at one building all the time, not moving. So 
This obviously uses a Google Maps engine, and um, it's a pretty simple um, design. You basically, you know, you have these text bubbles, and you can follow the um, the character, move around. Doesn't seem to be loading. Move around the map, and um, it's a very linear story. You just sort of click through, but. Uh, the advantage of this is that basically it's it's foolproof. You know, we you probably saw there that basically no instructions to this. All you have to do is click click next. And so this story was one of the most popular that we did. Uh, about a quarter of a million people have read it, which is more times than the author Charles Cummings' books have been read put together. So he was pretty happy with this experiment. So his so so Charles' books typically sell in the kind of 30,000 copy range. Um, so from Penguin's point of view, from the publisher's point of view, this has been a massive success to the extent that he's now more well known for having written this piece of short fiction um, than he is for writing his spy novels. Um, mm -hmm. And the really interesting thing is that Penguin are, are very happy that, you know, they're really quite proud of that, so that the URL to that story is going to be on the dust jackets of his books going forward, because it's going to be like from the guy who also wrote this. I mean, I think it, it, it's in, been interesting because, um, you know, we work for the Penguin sort of, you know, internet team, I suppose, to do this. And I think, you know, understandably, a lot of the um, people on the editorial side, the publishing side, were thinking, well, is this just going to be another, another gimmick? You know, is a story going to be any good? And is it, are people actually going to be able to read this? Or is it going to be too difficult to, to read, too difficult to play? And um, this story in particular, you know, has been really accessible for people, and it, you know, it just, it kind of just makes sense. Um, so, you know, you can obviously look different views, and um, we played around a lot with the, well, as these things normally are, as soon as we finished it, we came up with a whole bunch of really cool ideas of what, what we could do with uh, telling stories in Google Maps. One of the nice um, moments we had, uh, let me see. Or do the chapter flight to Scotland. Yeah, there's um, one moment in the story where the hero gets captured and he gets locked up in a shipping container. And of course, he doesn't know where he could be. He could be anywhere in the world. And this is where it takes a bit of a non-linear step. Uh, you know, he's basically saying, well, I could be anywhere within you know, a 500-mile radius of where I started because you know, he's been knocked out and he's not sure where he is. So you can imagine doing more advanced kind of... Uh, you know, branching narratives and games here. But this is, a, this is a fairly short story. It was about seven or 8,000 words. You know, you can read it fairly quickly. It takes place over London, Scotland, and, um, you know, worked well. And the, the author, the way he described it is like writing a film. In a film, you have your writer doing the screenplay, and then he passes it over to the directors who actually, you know, produce what you see on screen. In this case, it was a sort of collaborative process as well, where he wrote essentially the screenplay, and you know, we directed the action, and we you know, worked out how best to, to show it on the screen. So there's some um, that, there's some interesting stuff that, that we figured out when we were designing this. Um, we kind of got to our very last sprint, and then we realised that we wanted to try something different with the way that we were displaying the text on the screen. Um, we weren't entirely sure that that, that the standard API callouts were the best way to do that with the pop-ups. So one of the things that we tried doing is we tried just basically sticking a div um, down at the bottom, semi-transparent, so that we could overlay text in it in kind of subtitle way. Um, and we instantly figured out that that really wasn't going to be the way to go, because people already are familiar with the Google Maps interface. They already know how it works. And there's something really nice about just realizing the simplicity of, OK, I've seen Google Maps before. This normally tells me where my nearest pizza hut or wherever is. But all you've done is you've just changed the text in there. And then I've realized that we can actually tell a story using this kind of thing, and I can find out what's happening next. The other thing that we noticed was that people really started to invest in the waypoint marker and in the blue line that animates you know, this, this guy going around. They get really, really kind of like, oh my god, where is he going to go next? Um, and we think that's partly a combination of the first person um, narrative. So you, know, you actually do have that waypoint marker talking to you. It's kind of like, I'm feeling quite nervous, you know, I got bundled into a car and then suddenly it zips off down. And people are familiar with that kind of movement because they've seen it on stuff like um, Indiana Jones before. Um, 
and what was really interesting was that you know people were really really getting into we, we had quite a lot of elements of sightseeing that you normally get with something like Google Maps so people were going okay this is really fun because you know I can see I went to that cafe and he's going down the street that I used to go to to get to work uh, yeah we had some people say that they they quite liked it because they were going to visit London and uh, it was a nice way to, to see what they should see, see around London and um, I mean, obviously, you know, the technology behind this, there's nothing uh, shatteringly you know, advanced. Um, what we really concentrated on in this and all the other stories is really the user experience. You know, if you're telling a story in a new way, then you really have to make that, you know, the process of experiencing it, of reading it as smooth as pos possible. Otherwise, you know, the, the worst possible thing is that they, they start reading it and they don't understand what they're supposed to do. And so... You know, we, we tried and made, you know, the, you know, obviously it has the auto-scrolling so you can follow where the, um, where the protagonist is going. That, that took a while to make it work in, you know, in Internet Explorer and all the other browsers. And, um, yeah. So it's, so it's quite interesting because, I'm like, really, technically, this isn't anything that anyone, could have, anyone couldn't have done about, you know, 10, 20 years ago on a multimedia CD-ROM. Um, it's, it's fantastic because so many people could see it. Um, and really, I mean, we just used a standard Django backend for this. Um, the way that we got the text from our author was that he just delivered it as Word documents or as email. And we had a junior game designer um, inputting all the coordinates and all the animation data um, into the Django admin interface so that it could go in there. So there's, you know, there's obviously a bit of tweaking, and it's kind of um, really early dog foodie in that there's not anything we particularly want to expose to normal people to have to use because it gets a bit headachey after a while. But um, it was, I mean, it only took about, you know, it took, it took like two a, weeks? It took, you know, less than, less than two weeks, you know, to make the whole thing. And um, I, I learned how to use the admin interface in about 10 minutes, um, even though it was pretty, it didn't have any instructions. So we, we did get a, a few emails from the Google Maps team asking, you know, are you going to open this up to the public? Will you let people write their own stories and, and so on? I think it's, um, like Dan said, I mean, it's, it's, we would want something that was a bit more straightforward, but I think you know, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. And actually, you know, the genesis of this design came um, quite a while before we had the project. Um, I, I had an idea to make a story in Google Maps a while ago, um, and I tried doing it using the My Maps feature, you know, just the standard stuff you can do to make your own map. But, um, you know, that's, that, that's not really there to tell a story. It's, uh, you know, the My Maps feature is to sort of give you a static picture and, you know, work out directions and work out where things are. There was no good way of telling a linear sort of narrative and jumping from one point to the next. So, um, you know, I think doing this is really necessary to, to sort of tell a good story in Google Maps. And, and some, of the, some of the feedback that we got was quite, um, well, not necessarily surprising. It was just rather unanticipated. Um, we heard a lot from teachers um, who said that they were using the tool a lot, that they were using the story a lot to, to work with them. Um, kids in English classes, um, mainly because, you know, it was a really fantastic way of introducing them to a classic text, um, but also because it was something that we had explicitly designed to be as engaging and immersive as possible, you know, so um, it, it needed to be something that worked. Uh, and, and the other thing was the, the slightly more predictable thing of as soon as people saw it, they really kind of got the concept and they were like, okay, right, um, I give it five minutes until someone's scanned in the entire map of Middle Earth, and then they've spent the next three months working out, you know, all the different waypoints for Lord of the Rings, which yeah. is surprising because no one's done that yet. Pe pe um. <laughs> people, people want to teach history uh, using this. People want to um, also, you know, it's also very good as for teaching English as a foreign language, actually, because you know I'm told that it's very difficult to get, you know, to sort of engage people on just reading more stuff, and you know. Often, you know, teachers uh, teaching English as a foreign language will get people to watch movies with subtitles on and that sort of stuff. So this, this is another good way of engaging people to actually read, read stuff. So, so that was the first story, obviously one of the most popular ones, good one to start on. Um, the second story was uh, by Toby Litt. It was called Slice, and this was a horror story um, told, uh, it's a inspired by M.R. James's classic, The Haunted Doll's House. And this one was told over five days, um, uh, over two, two blogs, over a girl called Slice, slightly mentally uh, disturbed girl, and, uh, and her parents who've moved from America to the UK. And also these, 
these updates on the blogs were reflected on Twitter. So you know, we just wanted a way of you know, allowing people who are following the story to get these updates in, in real time. And um, this, this story was, it was a really good story, actually. It was quite suspenseful, and people, you know, we had a lot of people following it on Twitter. Um, we, the, the decision to put it on Twitter was actually fairly last minute. Um, you know, we, we hadn't really decided whether this was going to be a good idea, whether it made a lot of sense. Um, and actually, the, the nice thing that we did, that the author did as well, was um, to sort of rewrite the story specifically for Twitter. So it's not just a question, obviously, of cutting and pasting and, you know, because that wouldn't make a lot of sense within the character limit and within the actual use of mobile phones. So uh, the, the nice thing was that the uh, author got into it and started, uh, you know, having a conversation with the readers, not just over Twitter, which is, you know, obviously that's one of the ones there, but also um, over email and, and so on. So. This was quite a, you know, quite a nice use, basically, of, uh, of you know, different media, and it was quite popular for, for younger people. And, and the Twitter thing was quite interesting, because this was, so this was back in March before we had kind of um, spine-type objects or objects blogging or um, being anthropomorphized. Um, <clears throat> so we very, very quickly, something that we hadn't anticipated and we needed to make a rather quick decision on was, what do we do when people started following our fictional characters on Twitter? because we didn't need to follow them back. And it was kind of like, well, OK, duh, we can just follow them back. And, and then we had um, the wonderful kind of ripple effect of all these people who decided to follow our characters, and then twittering to all their friends saying, oh my god, I'm being followed by a fictional character in the story. And so it wasn't anything different than, say, telling a story in a blog and then people posting comments to the blog and then the author or the fictional character writing back. But there was something that was slightly different about that exchange when there was an explicit following back. And then, mm. So the communication wasn't necessarily different, but it was the fact that you know, someone had made this kind of friend request and then the other person, the fictional person, reciprocated it back. And, and clearly, you know, it was a good way of spreading word of mouth you know, through Twitter. Um, <laughs> Obviously, you know, we, we, we were here to sort of promote, promote the author and promote the book. Um, so the third story was um, basically write your own fairy tale. Um, not, not literally write your own fairy tale, but help write your own fairy tale. So this is for, for kids, written by Kevin Brooks, uh, a young adult writer. And um, this is, again, you know, nothing technically amazing here. We basically had... Um, you know, you can sort of name the characters in in the story, and then you know you can you can share these with your friends as well. Um, and uh, you know, it gives you it's a bit like a choose your own adventure, but instead of being a branching narrative where you know the the, the decision points, a tree of choices keeps on going out, it keeps on going back in to the same sort of structure, same classic structure of a fairy tale where you start you know with a Misfortune, and then you've got you know your quest, and then you've got your. It's actually a very sad fairy tale. I should I should tell you that. In, um, in, the, in <laughs> the static kind of um, <laughs> yeah. Brothers Grimm kind of tradition, you can choose between a bad ending, a very bad ending, and a terrible ending. And, and a not not quite so sad, but still sad ending. Um, actually, if you scroll up a bit, the, one of the one of the nice things about this is that the kind of, what people normally expect when you have a text box is that it's going to influence the text that comes next. So you're being asked a question, and then it will then re and then it will write the next part of the story. So one of the small things that we did was make sure that it just updates everything that happened beforehand. So then it starts off properly with your name. And this is another this is another um, one of the stories where, you know, w one of the design goals we had for this is no instructions. Basically, we didn't want anyone we don't want people to have to read any instructions. So you know, it's just questions. What what animal would be most helpful? You know, so this is sort of stuff you could do decades ago, really, on computers. But it's a question of you know, making it really responsive and making the experience really, really good. Um, the, the process of writing this was quite troubled. Um, the first author we contacted about this, um, I don't, you know, had problems sort of understanding the structure because it was basically, <clears throat> there, are about f there are six sections and you have to have, write four modules for each section. And they can be sort of slotted in and slotted out. And um, so, so that didn't work out very well. And our second author, <coughs> Kevin, um, you know, we we had to spend a lot of time, you know, sitting down and explaining exactly the structure of the story of him. And really, that was actually probably the most challenging part of the whole project. Um, 
is the first, was the first meeting with each of the six authors. You know, not, the technology is something that we can do, the user experience is something that we can do, but talking to the authors and uh, getting an understanding from, from both sides about how best to tell the story and how best to write it to fit you know, the medium was, a real, was really interesting. Um, and I think uh, you know, we, we've always worked with a lot of authors um, and we've always worked in, with stories in what we do. And um, you know, the nice thing about this is that a lot of the authors came out of it not just happy about the, the end product, but also happy about the process, because you know, obviously it would be pretty bad if uh, the, the authors came and didn't, didn't enjoy how they did it. Um, so the fourth story was really fun. This was a story told, uh, written and told in real time uh, over five days. So in the same way that you, know, we, you have these classic radio drama serials where it'll say, you know, tune in tomorrow at 6.30 to find you know, the thrilling conclusion, we wanted to do the same thing, but allow the writers to write it in real time. And so we, um, so basically this was written by Nikki French. And Nikki French is actually two people. These people write uh, thr uh, psychological thrillers, psychological horror novels. And, um, you know, it's always been a sort of a thing about how these people, these, you know, Nikki French are actually two people, and you know, how do they write together? You know, do they, does one person write one bit and one person write another bit? And so for this, we basically split them apart, and each person wrote one half of a story, a horror story about a relationship between two people when they meet and when they break up, and obviously the inevitable grisly conclusion. Um, and so. People, people, you know, you, you would come to this web, web page basically and you would see the, the text being written letter by letter as the guys, as the authors are writing it at home. And um, they, aren't, they obviously uh, know the story. Um, they obviously, you know, have an understanding of what the plot of the story is in advance. They're not just making it up completely off the top of their heads, but they they're not also, you know, they, they don't know what it is word for word. And so for them, it was a, quite an uh, exciting, quite a frightening experience, I think, for them. Because, you know, obviously the normal process of writing is, you know, particularly writing stories, of writing novels, is that you, you, know, you draft it and redraft it and you, you have it edited and, you know, there's enough time to really get it polished. And in this case, you know, as they wrote, it appeared on people's screens, thousands of people's screens around the world. And... Um, this was this you know this I'll give an example this um, this project was really interesting to the BBC they wanted to send over a camera crew to the author's houses and um, you know film out you know and show it on TV and and the authors were not happy about that they, they said they'd rather not because they were already nervous and having a camera crew would make them even more nervous and if you've got writer's block that would be pretty <laughs> fatal for this particular project you know it just stops they stop writing though are they both dead. Um, so, so, so the nice thing about this was, you know, obviously we had two different people and, and when they started out on day one, actually, you can see they, they played around the medium as well. And this is because we didn't know what the story was going to be. Uh, at the start, um, you have these two people and, you know, there's Lawrence writing a lot here and then there's, Te you know, there's um, Terry writing one line and it's, we were kind of, well, on the first day we were thinking, hmm, this is kind of a bit bit of a shame there isn't more back and forth here, you know, there's, it's just one big block and another big block, you know, what's the point of doing this? Worryingly, it looks like they were just copy and pasting. Which well, uh, yeah, um, but, but, you know, as, as the days went on, um, you know, you, you find them basically, they, they were literally, literally talking over each other, and this is kind of an interesting way of, for them writing and, and, uh, and reading, reading the story. And of course, we, we opened up a chat room for everyone reading the story. So, uh, you know, they were all talking about, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? Oh, I hate Lawrence, you know, why won't he, you know, why is he treating Terry so badly? And um, the authors, you know, were, were I think were, were in the chat room and just seeing what the audience reaction was. And for them, it was, a, every, every time we've done um, stories where the authors are writing in real time, the authors love it. It's like, I don't know, it's like crack, basically. They keep on <laughs> wanting to do it because, Authors, 
you know, the, there are very few, I think there are very few um, situations where people have, have to be creative in real time. You know, you have improv artists, you know, comedians, stand-up comedians, um, you know, actors, that, musicians, you know, that, that sort of thing. And I think writers, you know, particular types of writers really enjoy becoming performers and becoming their characters. Um, not in a physical sense, but, but you know, through, through the miracle of technology. Um, so, this was, so this was fairly interesting because our original spec for this, our original functional requirements were we wanted to see every single keystroke in particular, we wanted to see backspaces as well. Um, and we didn't, I, I don't know if we'd actually told the authors that we wanted to see backspaces as well, but given how nervous they were about the entire thing, um, it's, it's probably for the best that, that we weren't able to do that. And it turned out that, you know, um, so we talked to our developers about this and right, right, we want to see every single thing as it happens. Um, you know, best case, we have tens, hundreds of thousands of clients, and then we know that it's going to be really bursty and everything's just going to happen between, you know, six and 6.50 every evening. And they went, you're on crack. Um, there's only two of us, and we have to have this done in about two weeks. So no. Um, they said, because you know what turns out HTTP is a really, really silly way of doing that. Um, so what we realized was, OK, the trade-off that we did was we captured the text um, on the author's computers, and that was sent over. But in effect, what we ended up doing was we ended up faking all of the um, keystrokes. So what we did was we just captured the paragraph and then we display it locally. And then we introduce some jitter and we introduce some random error in terms of the timing so that it just looks like it's being typed. Um, and because we didn't need to show, you know, all you needed to know was that they were typing in real time. And it, was, it would have been nice if we could see stuff like the backspaces and we could see them changing words. But really it was enough to see that it was being typed. And you didn't need to know, that, that was the thing when we suddenly roused, you didn't need to know the exact timing of the keystrokes. And really, you know, the, the, the lag was about five or ten seconds. So if it was any bigger than that, we would have problems um, in the chat room. You know, people saying, oh my god, he's dead. And so on, saying, what? I haven't seen that yet. So, um, you know, we, we had a lot of constraints on this one. Um, I think, you know, there are better ways of doing this, yeah. clearly. Um, I mean, it got quite silly because we're kind of thinking, right, well, really the best way of doing this is making sure that everyone's got a multicast connection and we just stream them typing onto a screen and point a video <laughs> camera at it. Then you can see every single keystroke. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering how you managed. Are the authors synchronized or do they actually write sentences at the same time? Or uh, right now, I, mean, I only see the end effect yeah. right now. But it seems like they would kind of like stop at the sentence and then they would have to wait for the other one to yeah. say, are you going to write something or not? So, so, so the question was, you know, how, how do the authors, you know, synchronize and what, you know, were they, were they writing over each other? Um, they were on two different computers and um, basically, I, I'm pretty sure they were actually just sitting next to each other. Um, so, so no doubt they were helping, you know, they were sort of coordinating it that way. Um, and, you know, it's when, when they submit um, the bit of text that, that it gets posted. Um, we have, not, not in this project, but we have actually done live storytelling using multiple authors, like three or four authors, in real time across different continents. And that's, you know, that does get a bit more complicated. And what we had to do, um, we opened up a sub -ether edit document. Um, so this is a Mac text editor where you can do collaborative writing and you can see who's writing each bit and you can do that in real time. And um, they, we also had another secondary chat room where the authors could talk about what they were going to do next. And um, it was a really interesting experience, that particular project, because you could see people, you could see one person writing one line, another person writing the next line, because they knew they already talked about what they're going to do, and a third person editing both people's texts. And uh, you know, this, that type of collaboration in, in writing, I think, doesn't happen very often. Um, and I think we looked at IRC for this, yeah, but we, yeah. you know the clients, the web clients suck, um, yeah, yeah, and they just would. We didn't want anyone to have to log in yeah. or you know or use any kind of Java thing uh, that would have really, uh, really crippled the experience. Or at least the web clients did suck. I think there's a really great um, web IRC client that's come out over the last month or so. Uh, one final question: Have you thought of uh, maybe making allowing users to replay? Um, the story writing, since you essentially captured the paragraphs and then emulated the typing. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's actually possible. I mean, we talked about it, but we didn't really know whether, 
people would enjoy that. Because I miss it, for example. Yeah. It would have maybe been cool to be able to at least replay it slowly and see how they're switching up. I, I, th I think the only, the only problem with that is that, you know, there is, even though, you know, the story's the same, you know, you, you have this knowledge that it's not a live experience anymore. And um, the fact is, they weren't the fastest typers in the world because they wanted to get it right. So you, so you would, I mean, the, the, I don't know how many words there are here. It's probably only, you know, maybe maximum, you know, a thousand, probably less than that. And that takes place over, over um, you know, an hour. So, you know, I'm not sure how entertaining it would be if, you know, you didn't know it was live and if you weren't able to sort of gossip with the other readers in the chat room and, you know, speculate on what's going to happen next. So, I, you know, I don't think this is going to suddenly, you know, become a new wave of entertainment or anything like that. But, um, but I think it is, you know, very interesting for a lot of people um, to sort of get, get a glimpse of the writing process, actually, of, of these guys. Yeah, otherwise it might be a bit like, you know, reading your project Gutenberg text over a 300 board modem. And you're kind of like waiting for the next bit to appear. So the, the fifth story um, was by uh, a guy called Matt Mason, who wrote a book called The Pirate's Dilemma about, you know, copyright and so on. And also, this collaborative for uh, Nicholas Felton. And um, this, is, this is a story basically told in infographics. And we, um, you know, not a lot of technology behind this, really. Um, it was, it's basically an essay about um, the, how the internet is changing markets and changing people's behaviors. And um, this was, you know, just speaking from a kind of writing and, and graphic design perspective, this was a very challenging one to do. Um, we, I, I, th I think, you know, we, we might do things differently if we did it again. Um, because you know, it was the, the uh, manuscript got delivered as a fairly text-heavy document, and then the designer Nicholas had to go and convert it into what you see now, and you know, to sort of provide something that's visually interesting, with you know the, the graphs and, and and so on and, and the charts, and also you know tell you know fit the text in, you know, it was it was a difficult. Difficult challenge, but I think you know they did they did a good job, uh, the best job they could. But it was and and you know, Nicholas felt Nicholas is an absolutely fantastic graphic designer. Um, yeah. He he produces these annual reports in the style of a corporate report, where he just kind of covers all of his personal achievements and statistics throughout the year. Um, I, I think one of the problems with this one is that we just didn't have enough statistics. Actually, um, we we needed more stuff, and. Um, you know, that, that was a problem. And what we actually wanted to do was we, we did want to do a comic book. Um, and we wanted to do a really, really cool comic book online in the way that you don't commonly see comic books online. Um, so we just didn't want to do the, the kind of straight PDF or, you know, here's a big scanned JPEG of a comic book. And it, it was actually a question of kind of like production logistics and lead times yeah, in terms of yeah. getting someone who was good and who, someone who'd be able to illustrate to the standard that we wanted. We could get the script ready, but actually getting all the artwork prepared and inked and coloured and everything was just going to take too long. In a, in a kind of really you know, sad. vector flash ready format, and you know we're not big fans of flash in terms of you know delivering these sorts of experiences in terms of accessibility um, and speed and you know and just development. So obviously all this stuff is just done you know using HTML and, and JavaScript. And actually thinking about it, using using something like like the Google Maps display engine where you replace the tiles with um, comic book images and then you can kind of scroll from one place to the other and you can zoom in would actually be a pretty interesting way as opposed to because like the, the experience of reading PDF comics is just really bad and especially the flash ones as well because you kind of it's just slow you have to zoom in you can't see the image and the text at the same time and you can't see the entire thing so yeah I think a lot of a lot of well I'm not gonna get into that <laughs> um, <laughs> you know I don't want to sort of comment too much about about you know the, in comics online, but I think, you know, it is the way in which you know graphic novels are told online. I think is very conservative, and I think a lot of these guys, you know, would prefer, to be honest, to be to, to be doing it on paper, um, and that's often what they graduate to, actually. So, um, so the last story I, I mentioned that you know we kind of wanted to start strong and end strong. This one does not look as pretty as the other stories, but it's it's a choose your own adventure, and. Um, I, I don't know whether you guys know what a choose your own adventure is. It's basically, traditionally, it's a book where on the first page, you know, it's a book that you play. So it's the first page, you'll say, you know, you're running from a dinosaur. Do you uh, 
you know, try and attack it? If so, turn to page 20. Do you try and run away more? If so, turn to page 22. So it's these sort of branching narratives. And um, at the start of the project, uh, Penguin were, they said, you know, you can do whatever you want, but we think it would be a really cool idea if you did a choose your own adventure, because surely that makes a lot of sense on the web. You know, choose your own adventures have links and pages. The web has hypertext, you know, why not put that together? And um, initially, I, I was a bit resistant to this idea because I've not seen Choose Your Adventures done on the web um, very well at all. Um, if, if you've ever read a Choose Your Adventure, certainly, certainly the way I read these books is when I get them, about one minute in, I've got five fingers stuck into the book because, you know, I, I go and, put, I go and like, bookmark the page at all the different choice points. So, you know, if I die... I think, oh, well, this one doesn't work. I'll go back, uh, try, try, try the other choice. Oh, no, the, they both end up in dying. Okay, I'm going to go back to the previous decision point. You uh, want to win. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the yeah. problem <laughs> with Choose Your Own Adventures is that you die really often. And you kind of like, right, oh, fuck, I'm dead. I'm, oh, I'm dead again. Oh, I'm dead. And, and, you know, and that's, you know, that's kind of a fun, novel experience to do when you're a kid. And, wow, it's a book that's a game. But when you're doing it on the web, the traditional... You know, that metaphor of you know, sticking your, your, your fingers in the book, it just doesn't work on the web because you've got this metaphor of forward and backwards. You know, that's, that's how it works, you know, if you're just using you know, HTML pages and hyperlinks. Um, and you know, bookmarks, it doesn't work because you, know, you, don't, you don't have the page numbers. You can't see spatially where it is in the book and quickly flip back and forward to you know, work out where you are. Browser history just kind of works against us because it's it's really not a linear, you know, and which is interesting because browser is browsing isn't a linear experience, and you do have kind of branching. Um. So, so 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 that was a problem for us, and so you know, arguably, I think a lot of you know choose your adventures on the web are actually worse than than ones in book form. Um, another problem with choose your own adventures is just the nature of the story structure itself. Um, I think, you know, firstly, as Dan says, ends up in a lot of deaths, which is, you know, good if you're a kid and, you know, like things blowing up and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, for other types of story, it's, it's difficult. But more fundamentally, traditional choose your own adventures have a branching narrative. You know, it's the entire point. So you start off with a single, you know, start point and then it branches out, then it branches out and branches out. You've got a lot of mutually exclusive endings. And, you know, very, you know, what becomes very apparent early on is that really most people, if they're going to do one or two read-throughs, are never going to read the majority of what's written, which is a terrible waste. Uh, the second thing is, if you do want to read the majority of what's written, then you have to do an awful lot. You're reading the same stuff again and again and again, and there's a lot of repetition, a lot of backtracking. That's good to do in a book. It's pretty tedious to do um, on, online. And you know, certainly when I, when I read these books as a kid, I would read them about four or five times, and then I'd get sick of it, and I'd go and start reading from the back and start reading the endings first, and then trying to track back and work out, how did I get to this ending then? How, how do you go and get killed by you know, the flying dinosaur? Um, and then it, just, then it just gets a bit silly. So I, was, I didn't feel like this was necessarily the best way of telling a, a proper literary story, because that's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to do you know, a joke or a gimmick. They wanted to tell a really good story. So we came up with a system where we had a sort of hybrid choose an adventure, dungeon map, and um, text adventure. And so basically the links between the different choices in this were represented spatially. So here, this is, well, you've got the title card, and here you, know, you, you press down, just down arrow key to, to get to the first thing. And, we failed in our no instruction thing here. There are probably 20 words of instructions. Um, a lot of people skip them, but anyway. And you can see there's this mini-map down here. So it shows you that there's a, a little cell down here that, that we haven't been to. So you can move down. So begin reading the story. And um, you know, it starts out, you sit at your desk, the president of a country with nuclear weapons, simmering insurgencies, and rapidly proliferating pop starlets on music television. And you have three choices to move around. And instead of it being a link, as you move around, if you say you go and say, okay, leave your office, you can say, okay, that's where I was, this is where I am now. I can easily figure out how to get back to where I started. And you know the green the green box here shows you shows you where you currently are. Now interestingly I don't know whether you noticed, but um, 
as you move around, the text in the cells actually changes. So that, you know, that did say you were the president of the country. Now it says something else. Um, so this is a story that you know, changes in some simple ways based on the way in which you read it. Um, so I'm going to rewind a bit to, to the process of actually writing this story. Because you can see that you know, we have this, we have this uh, interface, which allows people to navigate around the story spatially. Uh, it allows you to uh, alter the shape and the content of the story based on your actions. And you know, this, although it's quite simple, it's very flexible. You can tell a lot of different types of stories using this. And um, we, we were, the author for this story was uh, Mohsen Hamid. And Mohsen Hamid was probably the biggest name of the six. He was uh, nominated for the Booker Prize um, a couple of years ago, top prize in fiction. He wrote a story called The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And um, he, w we spent a long time talking about what would be the best way of telling a story in this structure. So the first and simplest way of doing it would be to do a traditional branching narrative choose an adventure where you start at one point and you just cascade down. And you know, for the reasons that I mentioned before, I, I didn't think this was a good idea, and, and, and I think he agreed with that. Um, he, didn't want it, he didn't have a lot of time to write this. He only had a week to write it, and he didn't want to do, write a lot of content that no one would ever see. Now, the other extreme for this story was to do something very advanced, something almost like a text adventure. Because you could imagine if you put enough contingencies, you put enough rules in, you could have a system where I could go and press right, and it would say, pick up the sword, and you know, press left, you've got the sword now, go and kill this person. You know, so it's basically a fairly simple text adventure where you, you know, multiple choice text adventure. And um, you know, after doing a bit of paper prototyping on this, this uh, concept, we quickly realized that this would take too long to do, and it would require Mosin, the author, to become essentially a programmer. And that just wasn't going to happen. I mean, he was a smart guy, but he, he didn't want to do that. So he went away, and you know, we didn't really know what, what we were going to do. But he came back with, um, well, I can show you. He, he, this is, this is, his manuscript was delivered as a PowerPoint presentation, actually. Um, probably the first time that's been done. And um, <laughs> he, this is the shape of his story, the map of his story. And he, so you can see, obviously, it's not a branching narrative. Um, and you know, obviously, it's not, you know, it's not too small to be a text adventure. Um, what it is is basically it's three ways of telling nonlinear stories in one story. Um, so let me let me show you what this means. Um, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to use a pointer because otherwise, it's not going to make any sense in the video. Um, you, you start out here, and there are three options. You can go to the left, you can go down, or you can go to the right. Now, and all these things add up to the same story. Um, you know, they, sorry, they're all parts of the same story. And um, there is no ending to this. You know, there is no, there's no end point. It's just, you know, it's a piece, you know. And um, you have to read all of it to understand it, and you have to read some parts of it twice. But when you do when you are in that situation of having to backtrack, it's not that you're reading exactly the same thing, it's changed. And so you know, we wanted to sort of make that, make that quite a unique experience. So anyway, if you, if you start out, well, the final thing I'll say is the story is about, um, it's about former general who's become president. It's basically about President Musharraf in Pakistan. Most of Hamid is from Pakistan. He wanted to write about the political situation there. So, if you go left at the start, then you go into this traditional kind of branching narrative, like a normal choose your own adventure. So this is kind of the first, the first stage. And um, each of these branches involves um, the president reminiscing about his childhood. And if you go up here, then you can reminisce about your first fight. You can reminisce about your homework. You can reminisce about home. And each of these branches um, tells a sort of unique story. But after you've read all three, you realize they're actually talking about the same event. They're just three different depictions of the same event. And what's more, but you know, depending on which order you read them in, you get a different, different understanding of how things happen. So let's go over there.
And it is, oh, here we are. So your first fight, your rooftop, your schoolwork. So if you go up here, then you can think about your first fight. And just, just notice that it, it, you know, a boy's first fight, a, a true tester character, does not matter whether he emerges a victorious. What matters is whether he holds his head high. You, of course, did both on that morning long ago. So two lines of text. If you go up here, then you can go and find out what happened in the fight. I won't spoil it. But anyway, when you come back down again, um, of course, it's changed. You know, because we know people are going to have to come back down again. Um, and it sort of twisted the meaning of, of what happened um, in that. And that's, that's what happens in each of those three branches. So that's kind of, it's not rocket science, but it's just an interesting way of telling a story. So I understand that the system kind of um, ties these um, backtracking points nicely. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't magically um, prevent you from reading this, the, the text again if you continuously go back and forth. No, you can, you can go back and forth, yeah. But then it'll be the same. It will be the same. I mean, it could, you know, it wouldn't be difficult to make it, you know, keep on changing, but, you, you know. Didn't, you didn't think that it would be a good idea to, like, maybe color the boxes red or something to say, you've completed this, this branch, and if you go on there, you'll just see the same. So, so the question is about whether we have a kind of breadcrumb trail or whether we show the history of your journey through the narrative. Well, well I, think, I think that, you know, what, I think, you know, on that dimension, it's becoming more of, you know, a game. Than, than a story, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think, and I think that's an interesting thing to try, basically saying, you know, you, you colour the cells and once you've sort of finished that part of the story, once you've done all the interactions. Um, and, you know, the only thing I can say is this is basically version one. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, Mosin had a lot of other ideas of how he could tell stories, and he was kind of interested in saving those for version two. Um, if you want, we can call this the beta, if that helps. <laughs> The, the, <laughs> sure. So, so, um, so, so the, the branch to the bottom. This is a, a circular story. Um, no, you know, special technology here, but it's just an interesting way of telling a story. It's a poem, um, and depending on whether you read it clockwise or anti-clockwise, and obviously that's very easy and simple to do using the way we've set it up. You get a very different um, understanding of his life. Uh, and, you know, if you were doing this in a, in a choose your adventure book, it'd be pretty annoying because it'd say go to 94, go to 72, go to, you know, a lot of going around. Here you can, you can just press left and right and, and it works just, just normally. And um, to the right, this is the, the labyrinth. This is you know, the former general in his labyrinth. Um, and you can, you sort of, this is a figure of eight here, and you can travel around it in obviously a lot of different ways. You can go around the outside, you can go, go clockwise or anti-clockwise, you can, um, you know, a lot of different, different ways to go around this. And the challenge here was more of a, you know, not really a technical challenge, it was more of a, a, a writing challenge because to write a story or write a poem that can be written, sorry, can be read in multiple different uh, directions in multiple different combinations, and still make sense, and not just make sense, but actually you know, have some sort of meaning, is really incredibly difficult. I, I've tried writing a circular story myself. It's very difficult to do. To do something like this, uh, where it's going around, you have to employ a lot of tricks. You have to think about it very carefully and have lots of bits of paper, um, I'm told. Um, and the interesting thing about this is not just that you, know, you can tell you know, it's, it's a kind of fun you know, gimmick, but that the structure of the story itself reflects the content of the story. You know, it is a labyrinth. You know, his, President Musharraf is basically, you know, he's saying that President Musharraf is in this sort of endless existence in which he has fewer and fewer options and the things he does every day are the same things he does every day. Um, and that's why, you know, you can go around this, you know, several times and, you know, okay, it, you know, it may seem like it's the same text, but it has a different meaning and certainly the way in which you navigate informs the way that the story, you know, the meaning of the actual story. And so this, um, for, for me, this last story was probably the most novel form of storytelling we, we came up uh, of the six stories. Um, th this is, you know, it is kind of like a choose and adventure, but it's a different sort of thing. And we, were, we weren't sure, you know, how, how it would be accepted, but what we were really pleased by is that 
critically, people really liked this story. It wasn't, you know, well, the Google Maps story is a, is a fun story, it's a great story, but a lot of people were talking about it's a story on Google Maps. How cool is that? You know, they, you know, let's talk about the technology. Whereas in, this, in fact, one of the funny criticisms of, of that one, and because, and, and mainly in part that that was one that most people looked at, was that um, people were upset that it was a linear story, um, and we we're kind of saying, well, yeah, it was based on a linear, you know, it is a linear story. It's based on, and it's very much about how it's presented to you and how you experience it, as opposed to the choices you can make. And and with this, you know. This is kind of the uh, choose your adventure. The former general was really a perfect storm because Mosin really understood the form of the story and what what we needed. And um, when he when he submitted, you know, this this story map, I I didn't know what it was actually. I, I had to get him to explain it to me, and I, I was um, really impressed by what he came up with because now you know he obviously understands nonlinear storytelling in this in this fashion more more than I do. Um, and for him, he said that he, he genuinely learned a lot about the process of writing, actually, um, from doing this, about the process of storytelling and, and you know, narrative. And I think you know, that's one of, you know, and you know, as a third thing, we obviously, you know, we entertain you know, thousands of readers with this, and I think that's a pretty good result for this, for this particular story. And it was quite interesting because for, for all of our authors, really, because we had gone to them and we'd worked with Penguin in terms of selecting, right, what text, what classic text do we want to come from? Um, what is the interaction method that we prefer? You know, how do we want to tell this story? Um, and then we worked with Penguin also to select an author. Um, and because this was partly, although this wasn't entirely a marketing exercise, there was obviously marketing involved and we wanted to target authors who had titles coming out in the next few months. Um, it, was, it wasn't necessarily a case of asking an author if they wanted to do it, more a kind of case of, right, your book's coming out in the next few months, it would be really good if you participated in this marketing event. Um, and, and, you know, the, the worst thing to, to, to have happened with this is not so much no one reads it, because people are used to that on the web, it, it's that the authors would hate the experience, because if that happened, um, you know, word would get around, and people would not, authors would not want to take part in this sort of thing. And the great thing is that a lot of the authors have said, you know, if you do this again, I want to be there. And a lot of new authors have come to us and said, you know, if, if, if you're planning this, you know, count, count me in. So, you know, as a marketing exercise, you know, it, it did succeed. We had yeah. hundreds of thousands of readers. It was, you know, Penguin are very pleased. Um, I think you know what it, what's shown to us is that people are willing. You know, it's possible to tell accessible and good stories on the web in ways that you really cannot do um, on paper on other media. And so, you know, this is an area that that we are. You know, um, you know, we're happy that we can continue doing this sort of stuff with people like Penguin and other publishers. And I think, you know, it was a. Good, good first project for us. Yeah, basically. and and it was it was really interesting in terms that you know for, for a lot of the authors the way that they worked was and especially with say Charlie um, in the, in the very first story was that he essentially did, delivered something like a screenplay and we were the directors and we were kind of like right we know how this is going to work you know we know how this is going to be displayed and we can deal with all of that and it was really um, I think what was helpful on the author's side on the writer's side was that we were coming to them and we weren't saying right, we're going to do something that's going to be really cool and online because you're history and no one's going to buy books anymore, which is entirely what we didn't want to do and was interesting in some of the terms of reaction that we got to the project because we're like, this isn't, all we're trying to do is say short fiction, short stories are fantastic. Um, can we tell them in a different way? Not a better way, but can we just tell them in a different way? Um, and what was really nice was that Charlie was saying stuff like, you know, having, having the constraints that this particular medium, so say just Google Maps brought upon it, meant that he had to find writing in a different style and that was cre creatively, that was very interesting to him because it was pushing him in ways that he wouldn't necessarily have gone on with traditional novel writing. Um, and it's not like we were saying to any of our, um, to, to any of our writers, you know, we're going to make you do something that you really, really don't want to do. Um, it was more a kind of, here is some interesting stuff that we're doing online. Mm -hmm. um, we would like you to try it. Um, and you don't have to like it. You know, it's perfectly fine if what you want to do is just kind of do the solitary novel writing experience, and there is no kind of judgment call there. But there is this genuinely interesting thing happening over here that we would like you to try. Um, and there's been a fantastic reception inside Penguin, um, 
at least on um, not so much on the kind of traditional editing side because the editors are still very much kind of like right um, we've got our authors and they must write books <laughs> please do not distract them with this new internet stuff um, but what's really nice is that there is this kind of groundswell of going right but we could also have them doing other things they don't just have to be writers who produce novels they can be people who curate an experience there's i kind of want to end on two things one the daily telegraph in the uk said uh it's really telling that this project is called we tell stories it's not we enforce our copyright or you know we you know we uh you know <laughs> you know we publish paper books it's it's we tell stories it is about storytelling and we're just telling stories in a different way and um you know, the, the discussion, the broader discussion about books um, and the internet circulates around ebook readers and ebooks, which is a really, I, I think, well, it's an important discussion, but it's quite a, it sort of ignores what you can actually do with the new technology. It's like when uh, people started making uh, plays on, on, on TV, they would just film the play from, from the front, and now, of course, we have different things. You know, this is just really one of the first explorations of how we can tell stories and novel ways on the internet. So, thanks. Yep.